Hi guys. Good morning. I can't find my video. Hold on one second. One second. I don't want to see my ugly mug anyway, I expect. There we go. You look good. You look good. All dressed up for the case. I know. There's Mr. Lyle. I didn't realize we were going to have all the boards. That's fine with me, obviously. That's great. Be good for all of us to have a remainder, a reminder. Bob Weagle rolling out of bed. That's good. That makes me feel good. Now, Doug, can you get me continuing education hours for this? You know, it's not crazy. We included this on our, <laughs> on our TMAA, uh, Tennessee Municipal Trains Association program, more than once over the years. In fact, one year, I'd, I that's one of my horror stories. I hired a non lawyer woman who had been parliamentarian for who knows what this this club and that club it was a mismatch it was a cultural clash that I, I still have nightmares about yeah yeah you could actually but we didn't set it up this way but I wish I could I wish I thought about that with the advent of zoom it might be more important I agree. It, it, I, uh, well, I'll tell you, we'll get into war stories in a little bit, but I've got some things coming up in a jurisdiction to the southeast of here. I won't tell you that are their their ability to run a meeting is strictly marginal. It scares me to death. And, and on Zoom to do to boot, gosh, who knows? So uh, let me know when we should start, Lyle. Or uh, we'll give, we'll, we still have several people joining. Did you, did you uh, receive my Did you receive my PowerPoint? I uh, don't think so. When did you send it? This morning. Well, let me look. That, that would be helpful, I think. I can do it without it. But... Hey, hey, Doug, if um, Lyle puts you as a co-host, you can you can put that on yourself. I, I agree. Yeah, that'd be fine. Uh, um, I I do not have it, Doug. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. There it is. It was it was buried. Okay, sorry. You got it. Okay. Hey, Johnny. Nice to see you. This is this is great. I, this is like a big. This is like the Christmas party I didn't get to go to. This is this is great. Oh. Doug, I'm going to have to pull out at eleven o'clock. Okay, certainly. Let me know. I I, sh I shouldn't be that. Long. I hope not to be that. Take that long. Uh, it's sort of sort of hitting the high points here. So, uh, and, and I want to have a little question to answer at various times. Just let me know when we should start. We can start right now if you want. Well, let me just say that um, I'm recording this on Zoom, okay. and I'm also using a automatic transcribe service called Otter. So. Uh, if you'll just speak clearly into the microphone, it, it, it works a whole lot better. And I thought I could send this to other board members that were not able to attend. So, Doug, you can start at any time. Do you have a slide, Lyle? I do, and I'm going to share that with you now. And I'll get started. So, uh, my, um, I thought this was just going to be the BZA, but obviously all the other boards are are welcome too. I, so don't don't fuss at me about the caption. Um, on the next slide, um, wow, uh, this is my attempt at opening humor. Don't blame the lawyers, Henry. It's Henry Robert Singler was a retired Army engineer and general. So all this um, uh, ling, <laughs> all this incredibly complicated and sometimes. Just unbelievably uh, tricky procedure is the work of a, of a general and not a lawyer. So don't blame me. Don't blame the lawyers. Uh, the first edition was in 1876, and and I, I was just yesterday for the first time reading the introduction to the whole thing, 
And it's really interesting, if you're interested in history, uh, just grab a copy of Robert's Rules and to read about all the efforts that were made beginning beginning in, the, in, in Europe, at least in the 18th and 19th century with the British, and of course, that's the reason they're called parliamentary rules is because it was the British Parliament. And it, it's really fascinating to see how this evolved. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson had a version of, as, as usual, you know, he, had a, he had his own version of the Bible. Why wouldn't he have his own version of parliamentary rules? So he... Uh, it's really interesting just from a historical standpoint, so I, I re recommend that to you. Um, next slide, please, Lon. So uh, one question is, wh why do we have rules of order at all? And I'm thinking more in terms of the boards like the Board of Zoning Appeals and the Planning Commission and the Starry Zoning Commission that actually have administrative or what's lawyers call quasi quasi judicial or quasi judicial functions they rule on the rights of individuals respecting property um, and and I would say that they are at least twofold uh, one is is fairness to, 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 to bolster due process that these people the people are entitled to and the other and this is really important and we talk about appearances it's almost like it's it's cynical to talk about the appearance of things but is the giving the appearance of objectivity and impartiality, and I would add the appearance of competence to the public, and and it is so important. You, you cannot underestimate that, uh, and and particularly, uh, you know, it, it, a well-run meeting gives everybody confidence that this is a fair process, and that the people involved are making this uh, their decisions objectively and fairly. And that the city's business is being done competently and efficiently. So I, I don't. I, let me say, as, a, as, a, as an aside here, none of what I tell you is is meant as a criticism of the way things are being done right now. I, I think honestly, I think this is a well run. All of our boards are, are, are well run. Sometimes we don't pile up the stuff, the style points, you know, like. But sometimes we we're doing fine. We're doing fine in terms of absolutely fine in terms of fundamental due process, and also with you know creating that appearance. I, I have uh, recently been involved in two, I'm involved in two hotly contended, just duels to the death zoning lawsuits right now. They're both, in, shall we say, jurisdictions, more mountainous jurisdictions to the southeast of here. And I'm telling you, it is absolute chaos. And in addition to the problems they may have with not following their own zoning ordinance, which is not what you want to hear about, the inability to run a meeting competently under Robert's rules or any, you know, Robert's rules are the only order rules we really know about is, is creating legal problems for them. And, and talk about loss of confidence. It is just, it, it is, um, is so frustrating. Um, I went down to one of these meetings uh, live and it was like a new England town meeting where everybody was on meth or something. It was awful. And so it, it can be done wrong. It can be done much, much, much worse than, than you've seen around here. Okay, next. Uh, next. So I thought I would put in here uh, just in, in some, this, and this is all, this is sort of Doug Berry's boil down Robert's rules. I, we can't get off too far in the weeds. There's, I, there's six or seven things I want to talk to you about. One is the role of the chair. And it's interesting because in the legislative context, the, when the commission passing an ordinance or, um, you know, approving a contract, um, well, actually, all of our excuse me, all of our boards, the chair has a right to vote. You know, in Franklin, where I, you know, cut my teeth, the, the mayor could only vote to break a tie, and that's not un that's typical in a mayor aldermanic charter. And in our charter, the, the mayor always has a vote. But even in that, even when he does, the, the chair needs to make extra effort to appear impartial. And and the chair, because the chair runs the meeting, rules on the motions, and in general, um, uh, it, because of that role, should not be perhaps advocating as much as possible for, for one side or another when the matter comes up for discussion, even if they have the right to vote. Um, that can create a bad appearance. Uh, the chair, and I, I, I'm very, I'm proud of the way our board's not, not surprised, uh, uh, observe formality in, in addressing the chair. Uh, 
course, when the mayor is sitting in the, in the commissioner meeting, it would be addressed as the mayor, whatever title he has. But I think we're generally doing a pretty good job with addressing the chair as Mr. Chairman. I don't know that we have any chat, Madam Chairwomen right now. We should, uh, as, that, as that happens. But we don't at the moment, to my knowledge. Um, but it, that, once again, it, formality helps create the, the appearance of, of fairness and, and impartiality. This is a little, this is not new to, to um, uh, Chris and some of the other lawyers in the meeting because since all these rules of court, you know, um, there's a, uh, of course, you're, you're addressing the court and you say your honor or you say the court and, and this is what it comes naturally maybe to lawyers. And I, and I think, like I said, I think our, our board's doing a good job with this too. Let's roll over to the next one, Lyle. And then the, the same applies for the members. Um, it's it's hard to always say Mr. And Mrs. or Ms. with the last name. Um, I think that's once again, it's not fair voting. It's not a, not illegal or improper to call people by their first name. And one reason to do that is that you're making. Remember, on the Board of Zoning Appeals, the Star Zoning Commission and Planning Commission, you're making a record which might be able to be, have to be reviewed by a court. And so they may not know who uh, John is or who Gavin is, that they, they, they need to be reminded. So um, that, that's why that's important. And that, like I say, I, I don't see us transgressing much in that area either. Uh, it gets a little informal, but not, not too bad. And I, 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 if, it, if some of y'all differ about that, that's, I'd be interested to hear, hear, it, hear it. The other thing, and this is important, um, members should address only the chair or each other through the chair. Now that's, that's a good one because uh, you're in discussions and uh, I'd say it's a little bit like the court rule where you have two lawyers talking and, and they, the, the court rule says, well, you shouldn't be any coll colloquy, C-O-L-L-O-Q-U-I, Q-U-Y. -Q um, and that is, no matter what the other lawyer is saying, you're, you're addressing your remarks to the court. Well, um, if you get in a debate here, um, it's always best just to think about, um, you know, sure, certainly if the chair has recognized you, uh, then you are free to make your comments to the world. But um, in terms of, let's just see, say member, uh, member Eason at the planning commission says something that uh, one of his, uh, colleague disagrees with or, or, or wants to speak to and said, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address the remarks, Mr. Eason's remarks. And and the chair would say, you're recognized, Mr. So-and-so, you're recognized. So it, once again, just maintain this formality is important for the uh, for making a good record. And it's important for maintaining that appearance of, of, of uh, impartiality and efficiency. Next, next row, row please, wow. So um, once again, and forgive me for uh, emphasizing the BZA only, uh, Robert's rules, uh, interestingly enough, the only one of our boards that's formally adopted Robert's rules as their rule, parliamentary rules is the, is the city commission. I, I couldn't find anything in the other, for the other bodies where they'd adopted Robert's rules. I don't know what we would, what we would do if we, uh, if we didn't uh, adopt them, because I don't know of any other rules that anybody is familiar with. There are some other sets, but not in American uh, law or, or practice. Um, so, um, and, and as you know, on the, on the boards that are quasi-administrative, uh, Robert Rules only governs the board's deliberations. There's a whole set of what I call due process rules that come before the matter is turned over to the board for discussion. And if, you, if you roll, roll the next one, Lyle, please. Other way, other way. Roll one more. So, and this is this is uh, typical of both our Board of Zoning Appeals, the Star Zoning Commission, and uh, Planning Commission. So, and these are our, what I would refer to as our bylaws or our due process. And that is that the process, the item is introduced by the chair. The building official summarizes the item and, and then makes his recommendation. And then the applicant, the appellant, the applicant, the appellant of the sport zoning field, but the applicant in other contexts 
they speak, they and their, they are their representative speaks, you know, as you know, often a, an architecture engineer. And then uh, affected parties uh, speak. Uh, they'll have, uh, you know, uh, the neighbors, if you will, and, and also neighbors who, neighbors whether they're for or against. And at some point, and, and during that process, of course, it, it's perfectly okay for the, the board members to question the, uh, the people who are speaking. Uh, I, I think it's preferable to always go back to the chair and say, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask the, uh, uh, the speak, ask Mr. So-and-so some questions. And just always keep it, just flow it through the chair. The extent you get sidebar of things going on or um, it, it creates a confusing record. And really, it ultimately, if it's bad enough, it creates a uh, illegal meeting, a meeting that would be fun, you failed in the fundamental due process. And then and then all of our boards uh, have also used the term, we're now going to close the public portion. That is, we're going to begin deliberating. And that really is where Rob Fruits kicks in. Um, the, um, and something I meant to tell you, I slip my mind. Um, well, it, it, it'll come to me. So, so now we're uh, we're in in the deliberation, and we've got the rules. So, allow if you roll this over. Hey, Doug. Is, is it a good time to stop? Who's speaking? I'm sorry, I can't it's have. Ha this is this is hey. Haley. I just I just wondered if we could. Um, well, if you would mind if I rephrase just a little bit, because I think if we move on to the deliberation part, I, I think there's a ton of good in what you just said. And I think just like in in layman's terms, I think uh, the takeaway is that committee members are really not supposed to speak directly to each other ever. If somebody has an opinion and you directly speak back to them, that you you're I guess it would help to say the process for people of how they would then respond to someone that has spoken out um, during the course of the meeting. And I, I mean, my understanding of that process is that the chairman is to ask, would anyone like to respond? Um, if the chairman does not, then you can say, Mr. Chairman, may I respond? But never are we to uh, interact really like we're having a conversation back with and forth with each other at any point. Is that accurate? I, I don't think, let's just, if you're talking about, I said the, the landowner, the property owner who has asking for action by the board, um, said he may say, and this is like, Typical, like my experience before the Metro, Metro National Board of Zoning Appeals, if you, if you finish your presentation, and I'll, I'll say, does anyone have any questions? And the chair will say, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Berry? And, and that, I don't have a problem with, from a due process standpoint, from the people then, the board members questioning the person who's speaking directly. What you don't, and is it, but I do think it just, like I say, just think about routing it through the chair. Um, what, what's really problematic, and, and I've seen this once or twice at Bell Meeting, but not at the point where I wanted to scream, is like all of a sudden, some people will walk, back when we met in person, you know, sometimes architects and people would walk up to the podium to, to the uh, to the dais and, and spread out their plans and start talking to one member of the, talking to one member of the board. I think it may have happened, Haley, not, not to you. Yeah. Not, not to you, but I think you were at one of the BZA meetings, and, and, and my thing is, the chair needs to say, step back to the podium, address the entire commission. We're in a public meeting. Don't be afraid to be a Nazi about this stuff. I don't mean that that's, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, right. And I feel like for our chairman, though, like uh, oftentimes, particularly in a, in a zoning board meeting, the architect of a committee member will say something, um, just sort of talking things through, and the architect just pipes in, can yeah. I respond to that? You know, <laughs> and yeah. no, you know, they can't. But if we make sure that our chairman know, you know, there is a time for that and everybody starts to get used to the process of I can't right. talk until I am asked to talk, then, yeah. Um, yeah. It, 
it can get a little ragged. Um, you know, Metro, and we may talk about this, it's not Robert's Rules issue, May, and they, they have a time limit in front of their board of zoning appeals and their other boards. And it's uh, 10 minutes, and, and typically you have to reserve time. If you're the applicant, the appellant, you'll have to uh, reserve time to, to re respond, you know. And they also will, you know, have try to limit the comments of the neighbors. Not that you don't want to do that. You got to be careful about that, but they'll often try to get one spokesman or something. But I, I don't think that's really what we're talking about today. But yeah, Haley, I, I agree with you. My, my, I, right now, like I said, I don't see a chronic or terrible problem with this. It's just like, just keep in mind, just form, be formal, be formal, be formal. So, I, mean, I once I once told a, one of the pastors at our church that I think they kicked me off the, the, the session of what we call our governing body. I said, if the Lord love it, the well-run meeting. So, I think that's in Proverbs somewhere. I think it's in the Hebrew scripture. Probably. Yeah. It, well, and again, I, I just think in, in general, it, it, it makes sense when we talk about it, but then to see it used um, is a completely different process. And so for yep. what it's worth, all of the committee meetings at our state capitol are streamed every year. Um, this session is, you know, we'll have a special session. If you if you ever have time to just log on and just sit oh, I have, I have, for 20 I've been minutes. No, not you, Doug. I know you know. I'm talking, I mean, just for everyone else, it, yep. it helps tremendously because right. just to see it one or two times, you're like, oh, okay, that's, oh, yeah, I see. I, I, I agree. see what that means. It, yeah, it's sort of, it, it helps. Sort of gets in, it sort of gets in your blood in a good way. I think Jim um, um, Schulman does a pretty good job, does a real good job with the Metro Council, although that's a huge body. You think about 40 people and then week in, week out to do that. So, yeah, watch a meeting of um, I, it's been years since I've been the city of, I was the city of Franklin County in 2007, uh, and they do Zoom uh, meetings as everybody's doing right now. But, and so it's not due to me, yet, but if you want to tune in and see how they run a meeting, it's it's pretty impressive. If you just want to see a well-run city meeting, I haven't, I haven't seen, I've had to be in some because I've sort of worked for them. But anyway, thank you, Haley. I better, um, so, Lyle, are we ready to put up the next one? I don't know if that's on your screen or not. It's not on mine. Are you not seeing it, Doug? I didn't see it. I know what it says, though. <laughs> so I can, it doesn't I, matter. I see it on mine. Oh, okay, good. Barry's, Barry's rule number one. Now, let me say, you all. I think it's at, because I interrupted. We actually didn't go over the last slide, which is probably making this look out of. So, sorry, there's where you were, and I interrupted you. So, there you go. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, I can stand it. Um, so, let me say, you will look. Uh, you will look for hours in Robert's rule and not find the Barry's rule addition, uh, the Barry's rule amendment. So don't worry about that. So this is kind of, I boil down the rules that I see boards like ours encountering week in, week out over the years um, to seven, seven rules I think you need to be aware of to think about. And, and one is to make a motion. And what this means is as soon as the public portion if you will, in, in the form of the BZA or the Planning Commission or the HDC is complete. Or in, in, in the board, the commission meetings, as soon as whatever you have, whatever information you need uh, from staff, uh, whomever, then the next thing that happens is the chair says the chair will entertain a motion. Don't start saying this. Is, now, this is once again, I'll tell you in a second why this is not the end of the world. It happens another way, but the, the proper way to handle this is the chair to say the chair will entertain a motion. Is there a motion? Is there a second? I move, I move to grant this variance for the following reason. Da, 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 da. A, B, C, D, F. A, B, C, D, E. Um, and then is there a second? Second. Now, discussion. That's when discussion occurs. It doesn't occur before, under, for Robert Schultz Curis, discussion does not occur before the motion. Now, having said that, and, and, and one, another one reason, I, I think there's a reluctance to do that in our quasi-judicial boards, our administrative boards, because one, you may not feel like you're ready to 
make a decision and or, or take a side even and need more information. Or uh, there's a fear, so you're afraid that you're maybe losing, you'll appear it uh, partial when you're not, you're undecided. And the second is the worry that you're stuck with that, that uh, if you make a motion or a second, um, you, you, you're irrevocably committed to that position. And the fact is you are not. Make it, that's like putting the, it's literally like the referee at the beginning of a basketball game tossing up the ball, the tip off. You're putting the ball into play. You don't have to vote. If you, if you file and make the motion, you don't have to vote for the measure. If you make a second, you don't have to vote for the measure. That comes with the vote. So that's why I wouldn't, you know, and, and the reason you do this is purely, I haven't seen much real harm done here over the years, um, but it, it's to move the meeting along. I'll tell you a quick, quick personal war story. Uh, Mayor Purcell, Appointed me to the Metro Historical Commission, and then they, I was their representative on the Historic Zoning Commission for a couple of years. And let me say, Belmead is not alone. Every board I've seen, honestly, does it backwards. And I don't know, like I said, maybe I'm just being a, a, a purist and a, and a fetishist about this. It just gets on my nerves. So one day the chair didn't show up, and somebody said, Doug, do you want to be the chair? I said, Oh, yeah, I want to be the chair. So we got through the meeting in about an hour, which took us three hours. And this guy next to me said, what, what was that? I said, well, that was Robert's Rules of Order, um, which we theoretically are our parliamentary rules. And nobody complained, complained about having time to go and watch the favorite TV program instead of sitting in a meeting. So um, my, the best way to handle it is to make a motion first. If you don't do that, I'm not going to fuss. Everybody does it the other way. I don't know why. They just like to sit in meetings, I reckon. So any, any questions about that? Is that does that make anybody mad or uncomfortable? Or... You understand, you're making a motion, you're not stuck with that. You're making a second, you're not stuck with that. I mean, you can't vote the other way. Okay. So, Doug, my question is, this is Ron Ferris. My question is, following that procedure, which I like and agree with, um, does it, does that motion always have to come to vote? In other words, it gets voted up or down. And if it gets voted down, then a, another motion has to be played in. This is what we're getting to the, we're getting to that. All right. Getting it. Next slide, please. Tom. I'm still, are you seeing this rank or priority of motions? Yes. So, okay. So. This is, if I had a door prize to give away, I, I can give you, I'll give you a $25 gift certificate, restaurant of your choice, if anybody can tell me. So under Robert's rules, Mr. Robert being a good, a good military man, he, he, he gave assigned rank to motions. And so if you ever, if you want to see a decision tree that'll make, looks like an electronics diagram, look at the back of Robert's Rules of Order where it talks about the about the priority of motions and, and, and the different rules, which ones are debatable and which are in what order and stuff. And, and you really have, you parliamentarian has to have that with them to, if it gets that complicated. So which would you say, this is, this is our door prize, which motion would you say of all the motions has the highest priority and which has the lowest? Just a quick, anybody, anybody. It's, it's, it's surprising. One of them is, is, is delightful, and the other is maybe a little surprising. So. No, no, nobody wishing to. Um, well, a motion. Are you talking about like a privileged motion versus yeah, a main which, motion? Which one yeah, exactly? Pri which which motion that? If the privileged motion has the highest priority. Right, you got privileged and subsidiary instead of. I'm just saying, among all the motions. I'm not trying to get into all those seven categories. I, I would say I would. Uh, well, I would say privilege, but I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, other than that, covers, privilege covers a number of different motions. The privilege motions clearly have priority over security. Right. But of all the motions there are, all the motions you've ever heard, the ones you hear are made every day in Belmont in our meetings. So I, I won't, I won't mess with you. Hey, the Doug, highest. Go ahead. This is Bob. Hey, what Bob. Define privilege motion. Well, I'm about to. So the it, a privilege motion means that a motion can be made, which will take precedence over any other motion that's currently on the floor. Uh, it can, in some cases, be made when uh, when uh, another person has has the floor. 
and and like I said, we don't get into ranking and priority of motions that much. This is really supposed to be kind of a. I think, I think I know it is the move to adjourn, isn't it? The motion to adjourn is yeah. the privilege motion, which I like. I like that. I think that's. I do too. I've seen it used. I just remembered. That's the one. And it's number one. And which would you say has the lowest? This is just kind of counterintuitive to me. Right. The, the main, the main motion, the main motion, okay. the least. So a main motion can be amended. It can be deferred. It can be uh, all divided. All this other stuff. I, I, I just always liked the notion that the motion to adjourn was was priority over anything else. I, I, don't get me wrong. I just thought it might be. Y'all might think that was fun. Okay. Next one. You got that, how to handle amendments? Let me see how I, I can get my screen where I'm seeing this. Well, uh, yeah, it's Barry's rule number two, how to handle amendments. Right. I'm just trying to figure out a way where I can get it, where I can see it. Here we go. That's good. So uh, another quick war story, um, when I was, 35 years old and was came to Franklin City Attorney uh, just during one of our big growth um, uh, times. And then every meeting of the board of all was just filled with people hanging from the rafters, leaning against the walls. And no lesser a figure than the great Tom White was standing at the podium, one of Nashville's great zoning lawyers, and his property, he was trying to get some property rezoned for a subgroup. And an issue came up. A motion was made, and then somebody made an amendment to made an amendment to the motion. And I did not, as the Green City Attorney, know how to handle an amendment, the procedure for an amendment. And so, if I, at some point, my our mayor, the Miss Lee and Stewart, and some of you may know, Miss Stewart is a very uh, educated but Southern accent. She said, "Well, is there a parliamentarian in the house?" And I was. Very, I was considerably chagrined by that moment, and uh, Tom White had to come up and, and jostle me by the elbow and give me a notion as to what to do. So after that meeting, I decided I would learn about Robert's rules. So um, how to handle amendments. So what happens is, let's see, we're in the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals, and there's been a, a, a variance um, applied for, and a motion in a second, and we, we grant the variance for the following reasons. You know, there's a, there's a brook in the front yard that prevents the landowner from making use of the of the normal setback. Some some condition of the lot that we want a variance, and um, I we believe that this can be granted without harm to the neighbors and doing damage to the intent purpose of the zone ordinance. And then that's about to be discussed, about to be voted on. And let's say a member, another member of the plant board of zoning bill says, well. I would move, I moved to amend that motion and require the property owner to put up a, 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 a row of um, trees to screen the addition. And that gets a second. Well, that's amendment is then discussed. And there's a vote then taken on the amendment and the amendment passes. So then the chair has to say we, we're on the we're on the amendment, and of course the amendment itself can be amended, but we won't go there. So you've got a motion to approve already on the floor, and an amendment that has passed. So now you're back to the motion as amended. So the chair must then ask for a vote on the motion as amended. So it's really a three-step process: motion, motion on the main question motion and approval of the amendment and then a motion and say a motion on the and, and a second on the motion as amended and then a vote on the motion as amended takes care of it. that does anybody have any questions about that that's something that cities mess up all the time uh i, I said in one of these zone cases i'm involved in i was sitting there just aghast to read where a pretty good law pretty good lawyer a pretty fair municipal lawyer let something like this get away from him at a meeting and it was just it was not good not good for his case so anyway it is it, does that 
come as a shock to anybody that that's what has to be done? Is that, a, is that seem, it's okay. And it, uh, okay. No questions on that then? So is this, is what you're saying, Doug, that the, the, I mean, I understand the correct way to do it. I know a lot of times what we end up doing is making an original motion that sort of incorporates some type of amendment to what was on the agenda or, you know, like sometimes we'll just include it all in uh, whatever motion is proposed. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we have some of these contingency motions that we make or, um, you're saying if another member has a different idea or would like to add something to yeah. mm -hmm, or remove something from? I know, or, or, or yes, you could do that too. Uh, there's several questions. Have. One is it's not supposed to change matters as they appear on the agenda. It's simply, uh, for example, the Board of Zoning Appeals when it grants a variance has the power to add to, a, to put conditions on the variance. I'm just using that as an example. And so you've got a motion to approve it as presented uh, with staff recommending, you typically will say move to approve with staff recommendations. Um, and, and you know, you can also recite what criteria for a variance are present. You get a second on that, you get some discussion on that. And, and then another board member says, I think it would be best to require these folks to screen this addition because of how close it's gonna be to the neighbor. And so I move, we require you know, 10 Lee on Cyprus, God forbid. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, you know, install, plant it as a, as a screen. If it's a second of that, then you vote on that. You discuss that as much as you want. Vote on that. And then, then you, the amendment is passed. And now you're back to the motion as amended to give a vote. You can also move to delete things from the main motion. Okay. As you, as you just said, Haley, and it works the same way. I mean, staff could come in with a recommendation that they'd be required to install a you know, landscape screening, and, and, and somebody might say, I don't think that's necessary. I move, we delete, I move to amend the motion by deleting that requirement. And so you're process. voting to include the, it's Ron Ferris, you're voting to include the amendment or not include the amendment in you're the motion? Yes, yeah. If yeah. You move, if you have the motion as amended, the main motion is made, there's a second. Then you have an amendment that's made with a set and a second and passes. Then that amendment is on, is part of the main motion. And now the chair has to ask, I'm, we're going to vote on the main motion as amended. Now the, the board or commission may feel like that amendment is, you know, guts the main motion, but they, you know, they don't want to do it anymore. And that's fine. They can vote against it. Then. Vote against the motion as amended. Um, it, but it, once, yeah, I don't see, it, I don't see yeah. us falling. I don't see this being a big problem right now. But it's just one of the things you have to watch because you can't just let, assume that when the amendment passes, you've got to remember to go back to the main motion as amended. If that's the main. That's the main slip up. The main trick here. Uh, Doug, this is Joe Dugman. Um, yep. Do you think it's preferable? that once an amendment is made for the chair to repeat the motion and the amendment to make it clear as to what the motion on the floor is at the time? That's absolutely a good idea, Joe. I think the chair should be as, as um, active as possible on, on these, any procedure. Say, like, just remind you, you know, you say like, remember we're, remember we're voting on the motion as amended. And, let me go over that for anybody who has a question. So that's absolutely all, all, each of you who's serving as a chair or as a chair, that is absolutely a good idea. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to the next one. So the next one, very rule three is how to call the question. So this is a, it's been on my mind a lot lately because it's, it's not unlike, in fact, I think it's exactly like the U.S. Senate rule on, on the filibuster and cloture where, you know, as you know, under the filibuster tradition or rule that something can be debated on if the night of it, unless you've got a two-thirds vote, you can't cut off debate. And therefore, it amounts to killing, killing a piece of legislation or, or action. So Robert's Rules has a similar uh, critter. Uh, it's, it's ultimately called 
calling the question, moving the question, or moving the previous question is all the same thing. And the purpose of that is to cut off the bait. And uh, a lot of times you'll see the, the, the flaw, if you will, in procedure you'll see with local governments and, and state and state government too. It's might say, I call it, I call a question. And the chair will say, well, the question's been called, let's vote. And the fact though is you, the calling the question doesn't stop the, the debate. It requires a vote. There may be people out there who still want to be voted. They want to go on to midnight. And so it has to have a cutting off debate requires a two-thirds vote. Once again, I, I thank goodness I don't think I've seen a situation where people were doing almost a, were talking too long and that this came up. Uh, most of the time it's it's just probably been handled by consent that we said, yeah, y'all ready. So y'all ready to vote, and that's okay. That's that's uh, that's the uh, that's the country version of uh, calling the question. Um, any uh, any questions on that? Does it always require a vote? Yes, the question requires a vote. Now, now, if the body, and we'll get to that in a second, the body can consent with with, with boards of five people. A lot of stuff is going to be done by consent or quote without objection. But theoretically, uh, it, it, the where would not require a vote, Joe. And I'll come to consent at the end. But where it would not require a vote would be if, if, if everybody consented. If one, if one member says, "No, I, I, I'm not going to consent to that. Um, I think we need to vote that. I'm ready to talk about this some more." So, yes. Uh, theory, it requires a, a vote unless the whole body consents. Okay, you ready for number four? The next one. Um, this motion, the motion to reconsider, is one that we saw come up in a recent BZA meeting, what in maybe in November or December, and this is where you've had an item that has passed. Or, or been turned down at the meeting, earlier in that same meeting. And and you get to thinking about it, maybe maybe the, the applicant has to be recognized and they say, you know, we, uh, I'd like to point out to you something that may, maybe you should reconsider this. Or somebody on the board says, look, I don't think we did this right. Um, but can we consider reconsider it? The answer is yes. Um, and but interestingly enough, the motion to reconsider must be made by someone on the prevailing side. So if it, if it was four to one vote to um, approve some item, the person who lost, who, who position was outvoted, doesn't have the right to keep trying to reconsider votes. Otherwise, there'd be no end to it. So uh, that, that's the only pit, pitfall on that motion to reconsider. It must be made at the same meeting or session uh, I don't think the cities are too strict about that, and it, it only requires a simple majority. What we did, and, and I, uh, there's another motion called a motion to rescind, which does not require that the motion be made by someone with the wailing side. I, you know, that's what we did that night in my in my advice. I can't remember why I didn't do a motion to reconsider, um, but. In some ways, that's also an invitation to endless, endless debate and bickering because, unless it looks like from by consent, the, the board wants to wants to reconsider it. Um, so, like I said, this particular particular nuance of the motion to reconsider maybe is not that big a worry. Bob, did you have a question? I'm a little uh, woozy on this uh, reconsider thing. Uh, if I was on the prevailing side, and uh, am I changing my my mind on the uh, on the motion? No, you're not on the action on what the action taken. No, not necessarily. You just may say, "Look, I I think we need to look at this again." And you can still vote. You can you can still vote any way you want to. You can't, that's the good thing about all these motions. Making a motion doesn't mean you have got to vote any way. It just means make for matter of procedure. Let's bring it back. I, you may say, uh, uh, you know, I voted for this. I, I still would be for it, but I, I, I'm sensing that some other people want to hash this out some more. So I moved to reconsider. So yeah, you're not. You don't have to vote the other way. That's that's your question. 
Am, am I uh, throwing before the, uh, the board that the reasons why we should reconsider? Am I uh, yes, you don't you don't use that to re you don't use that to rehash all the pros and cons of the main motion, but the reasons to you, the debate, if you will, is allowed on the reasons to reconsider. And uh, so it, it almost it almost gets into the main motion. I just said that I'm going to why why we're talking about something else. I'm going to check my book real quick and see if that's debatable. It is debatable, and you can go into the main question. So it, it's a motion to reconsider is is debatable. I, I stand corrected. That's why you've got to have this little manual out. Otherwise, you, you go crazy. Anything further on that one? I think I understand what you're saying. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Next one. Next one. Wow. <laughs> Once again, this is me being me being uh, prissy about it. Table, a tabling motion is a very limited motion under Robert's rules. Tabling means you, you have something on the, and, and let me say, legislative bodies, large and small, state and local, use this term improperly. Tabling is where you, something else of immediate importance has been brought to your attention. And the matter which is being discussed is then put on the table literally put on the table until you get through this with this matter of of, of, of supreme importance uh, you know some sort of emergency something that I, I can't think of an example of the scene in the city right so what we usually don't fall into this trap um, most of the time we will see this a lot in the BCA well in, in all of our boards the need to defer an item and typically it'll be to a time certain. We, we, I know, we, I think all the boards did a two month deferral, but with, with the understanding that the applicant can come back in a shorter time if they need, if they don't need that much time. Um, it is debatable, uh, but only on the reason for the deferral. In other words, it doesn't open up debate on the main motion. Uh, and, and this is something we see so frequently. I might stop here and ask you if you have any questions about it. it, it it's also, privileged in the sense that it's it, it's more you can, let's say a motion to for the main questions on the on the floor motion to amend is on the floor uh, and, and you're about to discuss that and, and somebody in the board says look mr chairman i moved to defer well they, that 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 knocks the legs out from under anything that's already on the, on the floor so if procedural motions like this typically uh, our precedent over the main motion or even a ministry main motion. But this is something we see a lot and do a lot, uh, the motion to refer to a time certain. Does anybody, uh, anybody have any questions about the use of that right now? When do, I, when do we use the term tabling? I would never use it because it never has. Tabling is just, I mean, like I said, this is just me being uh, uh, not nice about it um it just it's, tabling has to do with a, a matter that has been brought to the board's attention that requires immediate attention over something that's in, in the normal order of business okay and tabling has become a popular i mean i see that in, i see it in church meetings i see it in uh, I, i've seen it incorporated it as, as terminology into zoning ordinances and it's just just a misnomer i think i think deferring to a time certain and deferring indefinitely are what you really want to do so um, Doug, I'm not, not going to call anybody out and embarrass me if they say tabling. You know, I just roll my eyes. Uh, what Doug, is the? Uh, I was just going to say those two motions. Is that just an up or down uh, majority? Yeah. Yes, John. Good question. Now, the, the motion to defer indefinitely is uh, it, it's a good way to if you want to kill something. I, I don't think I've seen that on any of our Bellamy boards yet. Um, deferring indefinitely is basically saying, "What's that word?" <laughs> We're going to kill this. We're going to kill this item. Um, if you defer it indefinitely, then what does that mean? You're never going to vote on it. That's like a might as well vote it down. Why people want to do that? I, I think probably legislatively people want to do that so they don't appear to be inalterably opposed to something. They don't want to vote it down, but they know they're killing it. And 
like I said, I have not seen that come up in our deliberations. Have any of y'all remember an occasion when we did that? Okay. Doug, it, Doug, I have a question. If yes, if if a motion for deferral is made and uh, approved, when it comes back, when the item comes back under old business, do we we have to go or should we go back to the original motion uh, as amended? Uh, that's, a if great, that's, amended? A great that's a great question, Mal. Um, you know, ugh, I, I think. <laughs> I think he would go back. To, I think he'd return to that same procedural posture. I don't know the answer, though, just sitting here. I, if, I would think if the applicant stood on their rights for that, they might have something there. But, you know, they might be they might be stupid and foolish to do that because the board might have had its reasons for for uh, continuing it, for deferring it, and it might have been typically to get more information. And that's what we usually say. So in many ways, most times, and Lyle could chime in on this, most times the reason we would do it is because the board needs more information. So if the board didn't have enough information when it got the motion the second, I don't think it sticks uh, now. Does that make sense? I think, should, shouldn't we just, I, I, see, I understand this question. I think technically shouldn't, if we are waiting on something like more information, perhaps that applicant should come back as new business versus old business. I think the old business, okay, would put us to the old motion, whereas. Right, I think that's yeah. right. And then that would be, that makes sense that that's why you're doing it. Um, um, anything else on the deferral gambit, if you will? Um, and let's see, what's next? Well, wow. So this is one motion for division of a question is one we've seen recently this year for the first time. And Pete, Pete Sebasky, I remember, we, I think it was the meeting we had out of Bellmead Methodist Church. We had an issue where the first time we had, you know, the Board of Zoning Fields has considered swimming pools as conditional use, but then we had an application uh, for swimming pool that was also outside of the building that so were part of variance. And so we have, Typically, um, or not typically, but in that meeting, we, I don't know whether we actually had a formal motion for division of the question, but we just agreed that the board consented to taking the matters up separately. So if you had to do it more formally, um, if it came up that way again, you'd say, uh, why well, move that we divide the question? Uh, the variance be considered separately from the, the, the grant new award of a conditional use permit. And interestingly, I didn't know this until I looked it up yesterday. It was not debatable. So the chair would say, is there a second? And is there a second? And the chair would say, you know, what's the vote? And that would be um, decided. Um, and and, and go, go ahead, Lyle, one more. We can have all the questions at the end. And then so finally, something that we've I've alluded to throughout has been the idea of acting by consent. And because our boards only consist of, well, five people in the case of the Board of Zoning Appeals and HCC and, and the commission, and then nine in the case of planning commission, the, uh, we often act by consent, and, and that, that is appropriate. So the chair, once again, though, remembering the chair's role, the chair would say, uh, without a, typically you'll say without objection, uh, is there any objection to that? And, and I think that may be how we handled that uh, swimming pool variance slash conditional use permit a while back. But to, to say without objection, uh, we'll, we'll take these up separately. And then but you, anybody who does object needs to voice that objection. Um, so any, any thoughts? I, you know, that's that's really all the material I have. I hope that's not too little. I never heard, and nobody complained yet about my talking too little. Um, but I'm happy to do questions and answers on anything we've discussed. Hey, Doug. Oh, yes, yes, sir, John. It, 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 things with all of these Zooms, and, and I've been in meetings where there have been 20 people on there, you know, and, and you try and have people say their name before they make a motion both them and the seconders. Is there anything else in a Zoom meeting that kind of we need to be aware of? 
it's funny you mentioned that, John. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here like a bird of prey waiting to attack a Zoom meeting that I'm going to be attending on Monday night because under the under the order, the, control, the, the, the state's order, that's very critical that the person state their name, that the board members state who they are. That's why the vote has to be by roll call, but also anybody speaking and the chair has got to be hyper hyper vigilant, if you will, to make sure that people are identifying themselves, doing the same things you would in an in, in, in person meeting, identify, identify yourself, what's your address, and make sure that you make a record. Uh, and I'm gonna, I need to talk a while, I need to talk to you about this program you've got for uh, transcribing a video meeting, because that's critical too. It's our obligation as the city to have a reviewable transcript if for some reason, you know, something would give this challenge. So, uh, does that answer your question, John? I may have started talking. Does that answer your question? No, John? that that that's that's good. I appreciate that. Okay. Yep. Uh, anything else on anyone's mind? Uh, uh, this is Larry Wick. Uh, hey, Larry. I remember in the past you said there's a, a law that if we the board didn't act on a land use deal in 60 days or something, that it had to be. It would automatically become law. Yeah, that's a plan. How does that relate to the mo motion for deferrals? Is motion to defer an action, or do you have to take it? <laughs> that's a great. That's a great question. That's a great question. No, uh, you know, it, it's a plat. It's only it only applies to plats, final plats, which we don't get much new development in Belmead. And uh, plat work is pretty routine, but it um, it would be. Uh, it would not, a motion to defer would not be considered action that they would, they would get you outside of that statute. That's a great question. Huh? Um, what, what the best, the best, if we got in that situation on that 60 day requirement for approving class, and the one thing that there's an attorney general's opinion about this years ago, but I think it's still good, is that a lot of times the reason for deferring a flat is the reason for deferring anything, and that is because it's inadequate information provided by the applicant. So one thing you could do if the applicant won't withdraw the item, which is often what we, we would make them do. But in Franklin, we'd make them, it was so many plans, we'd make, if it was something wrong, we'd make them agree to withdraw it so that 60 days wouldn't, wouldn't apply. But you could make a finding and say, we moved to defer this for another month because and list the following deficiencies of what they, of what they submitted, and that would be a reason to you get around that statute that way. Anybody else? Yeah, Doug, this is Joe. Hey, Joe. Would you consider running a mock meeting for about a minute or two? <laughs> if, I don't if, know. Okay. <laughs> oh, sure. Joe, what, what do you want me to do? Uh, I just kind of go through the, the basics, you know, with what you just told us and very, very quickly. If not, mm -hmm. it's okay. Well, no, I, I, if I can do it confidently after all this brave talk about how it's supposed to be done, I might not be able to do it right. I, I can tell you what, having observed uh, a meeting recently that was chaotic, I would think one thing is to say, I, I call this, I call it the, the, you know, whatever the numbers are, January 18th meeting of the Board of Zoning Appeals to order, call the, call the meeting to order. I literally was in a meeting two weeks ago where the, the chair just started talking. And so call the meeting to order, announce as as you do and Pete did and, and, we, and Mal does the procedural assumptions about how the, how the process is going to go for people who have business before the board. And go, the, the, the board of mayor and all of the, excuse me, the board of commissioners has their own, they have a set ordinance based um, uh, order of business that has to be followed. And, and of course they, they have like, you know, citizen, citizen comments, and board, but, but the other boards will have an agenda. So you don't need to adopt the agenda or anything, but you might, uh, after, after you call the meeting to order, then do as you do, uh, explain the general rules, particularly with the BZA, HCC, and Planning Commission, uh, that there's a, an appeal uh, from the action to the Chancery Court for writ of, of certiorari. 
And uh, like I said, I, I have, I've been impressed by, I think the litany that y'all have developed for these boards is good. Is good. I, I have nothing to, nothing to criticize about that. Uh, hey Doug, uh, yeah. Mrs. Lyle, could we hey, possibly Lyle. pick a pseudo chair and some board members right now and just do a little mock run through just to kind of show how it's done? I, I, I make a motion I, I, how to mend, how to okay, table, how to defer. Let me get a let me get a piece of paper. Let me get a, an agenda that I've got from another place. So I have something to go on. I'm like an old Methodist circuit rider. I, I, I take this spiel around the state and, and, and I collect agendas and stuff. Um, let me see. Yeah. I thought I had one. Maybe you got maybe this week's um, it's one of the one for this week or next week. Wow. Yeah, we sorry. could do we could do the yeah that plot that whatever we're about to the the MP. Z is about to see, or maybe that maybe we shouldn't do one we haven't done yet. Why we yeah. can go backwards? Yeah, let's, <laughs> yeah, let's like, not do that yet. Yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to do a, 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 a future uh, item. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Uh, I get you. That might be a little bit. Oh, here's one. Okay, tell me, tell me, planning commission May 21. Um, so. I don't know how much y'all want to role play, but um, you know, I will just uh, call the meeting to order and then uh, welcome everybody to the meeting. And uh, you know, take the first. All right, Doug. Meeting. Who who do you want? Let's just pick a chair. Let's just go down. Use your scroll. Pick somebody. We can do this. I'll let I Steve. Mean, well, Steve, Steve is the chair of the, of the, of the planning commission. Uh, so great. Um, on the particular ordinance, the particular agenda I'm looking at um, is, is the. Uh, hey, Doug, you forgot the minutes. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, no, I said, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Oh, so good. The, the first, uh, th this particular agenda has approval of the minutes and then consideration of an ordinance to close Pendleton Avenue and abandon and close Pendleton Avenue and an ordinance concerning the sign code. So. Some of, as you may know, one of the roles of the planning commission is to make recommendations about changes to zoning. So, Steve, um, you're the old hand. How would you? So you've got the minutes and you've got consideration of two ordinances. How would you kick that off? Well, of course, we'd start the meeting. We'd get the minutes approved. Then we'd move on to the first item of business. I call on Lyle at that point to present the first item. Lyle gets up, says, here's what it is. Here's what's going on. Um, at that point, I would ask any questions from the board. Um, then, if there were any anybody there in support or opposed to it, we would call on them. Uh, I would close that part of the meeting out. We, we would go to a discussion of the, uh, of the motion. If any amendments take place to the motion, uh, we would consider those. If there weren't any amendments, uh, we could call for questions, uh, get a vote on the call with questions, move the motion forward, get it approved. The, the only, uh, you may. That was a quick version. Yeah, that was a good version. Uh, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the only thing I would, and I don't, I don't, the only thing I would change is um, once Lyle had completed his report, uh, I would, I would say uh, anybody, you go ask anybody else be heard. And this is not Robert's rules. This is due process, if you will. Then you would say, um, the chair will enter. I would say the next thing out of your mouth is the chair will entertain a motion. And then uh, Karen says, uh, I move we, uh, we recommend ordinance 2019 to the board of mayor, not to the Council for approval. Somebody said the second, and then you say, "Is there a discussion?" And then that point, you get the discussion on that, and then uh, you know, I, I don't know that you would need to go through calling the question or moving the question. That's probably by consent. People are ready. To, you say finally, say any further discussion, and you know, say y'all ready? Y'all ready to vote? Like I said, that's the that's what I call my 
I read in that column the question. Y'all ready? Y'all ready to Hey, vote? Doug. On, on that first motion, um, just to to get it, to get the item properly before everyone to be discussed. Do, right. do you have to give a a statement of I move to approve? Couldn't they just say uh, motion on the item or whatever we want to phrase it so that we don't give a, a like foreshadowing of? I don't think it matters, Haley. I think okay. Could, yeah, chair, uh, chair, going to say Alan entertain a motion. This might say so, so moved, so moved. So moved. Yeah. So moved, okay. Second. That way, you don't have to tip your hand if you plan on voting against it. Later yeah. On. Okay. The whole purpose of the motion is to say just to put the ball in play. So yes, yeah, you can do that. That's typical. And then Steve, and then of course you uh, go through each item that way, take a vote. And um, uh, I mean, I, I I have no worries or qualms about the way an old BGA mate Steve Hall runs a meeting. He probably well, learned that. In he learned that in Matty Lee, learned that in Matty Lee Duke's speech class, I expect. Yeah, but I was going to criticize you on your Latin. No. Mr. Thompson would have given you an eleven on your no. score for the day for your Latin, but you 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 ended it with a Y instead of UI. Well, I corrected myself. Well, good. That's all right. But anyway, <laughs> I think it's important for us as chairs as well as board members, when in doubt of where we're going, we can always stop and say, Doug, keep us straight with this it, it's all about well thank you for the, the conference I, I, it's all about um as i said it's it to me it's about image with the public and, and fairness to the people who have business before the board and, and I, to the extent we're not trying to use and we don't see this either we're not like the u.s congress we don't see people using procedural tricks to mess people over i've never seen that in a city board that would be a very foolish way very foolish way to behave uh pete you're shrugging your shoulder you, you, you're uh, you, you're well, ready yeah i do have a question that um after the motion and a second to the motion and when discussions ensue uh can uh, the chair or members request the chair bring back others into the discussion, others, either um, an applicant or those in the audience or you or Lyle or? I think so. I think you can. I think you should. And this is where Robert's rules, as I said, is an adjunct for the rules we have for our boards, which have, have a sort of different purpose. Robert's rules is so the discussion runs smoothly. The other rules are have to do with providing due process to the people. So yes, I think the chair, uh, once again, for formality's sake, the person needs to request it. Uh, and if they interrupt, they interrupt. And then, Mr. Chairman, um, I would just end, can we provide some additional information? And, and once again, the board can say, and this is where you probably often going to consider this as a consent matter. Say, does anybody have any problem with any objection to that? And, uh, and some board members say, yeah, I don't want to do information. Uh, what about the idea we closed off the public portion? Well, I mean, that's not a Robert's Rules. It is, but you can reopen it, uh, Joe. But, and, and there's no there's no rule that says you have to close off the public portion at a certain time. And you can you can break back out if you need the information. Um, I, I, there's a balance that has to, with Zoom meetings, there's sort of a balance that has to, well, even in the in-person meetings, the balance has to be struck before letting people just talk all night and, 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 and you know, abuse the, 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 the forum, so to speak, and, and on the other hand, let people be heard, and uh, people tend to complain more about the latter, not I never get a chance to be heard, and Sometimes you just have to be patient, but you know, I, I, like I said, I don't, I'm not seeing a big problem with that right now. I get it. I get it where sometimes it looks a little ragged if you go back and forth, back and forth. I like it better, Joe, when you, when you do, when you do close the public portion, and that's it. But sometimes you just can't tell. Sometimes it might be worth it to uh, open it back up if the board doesn't object to it. Now that's a good question about. What mo and I don't know the answer to without researching it. What would be the let's assume board member Karen? Karen, I'm picking you because I can see you. I can't see everybody. Else. Um, said, look, I don't, I don't think we should do that. I, I, I move fill in the blank, or somebody would have to move to reopen the, 
reopen the meeting, I guess, because she objected. So I'm trying to think what motion that would be. Uh, I'd have to look it up, but there's a motion out there. If for some reason we didn't have a consent, somebody would have a motion would have to pass, probably just by majority, that we did want to reopen the public section. I just don't know the name of it right now. I so. think, Doug, I think, I don't want to talk out of turn here, but I, I think that the it is without objection will go out of session and then if anybody objects then you vote by simple majority uh but typically there there isn't well you're not going to go out of, you're not going to go out of session um it's not, you're really talking about departing from one of your rules by real close um, I will get like back. suspending the rules or something. Yeah, almost suspending the rules. I, I'd have to think about it, Haley. Like I said, we're not trying to set up hurdles for people. And right. Um, I, I'll I'll have to think about that. What exactly would be the the, the, the type of motion that would would be in place if, if, if a member objected to, to doing it to reopen the proof? How no, would God. So you go ahead. Anybody else have any ideas? But I just don't know off the top of my head what the motion would be. It's a mo there's a motion out there that would fit the bill. I've got a question. Um, yeah. Has anybody sued the city over procedural uh, infractions as best that you know? Not, not Bell Mead, to my knowledge. I have seen in, in, in cases where Robert's rules and fractions are kind of lumped in with other procedural errors to bolster the case. Well, the reason, the, reason, the reason I bring it up is I can speak for our committee and I think I've sat in enough BZA meetings to know that in terms of full disclosure, uh, allowing people to speak, um, I think we handle that quite well. Absolutely. Um, I and we have very few real tough ones to go through. Um, I've got another question. Uh, was there a recent Supreme Court, Tennessee Supreme Court ruling on planning commissions, I think in Knoxville or in Williamson County or somewhere, that gave better, dis further discretion to planning commissions to be able to make decisions that are not necessarily based on the absolute rules that have been established by the municipality. In other words, a good example would be the Brown case that we had a couple of years ago, where the Browns on Jackson Boulevard met the rules of subdivision, but it was in our discretion that it was not best for the neighborhood and yeah. denied the subdivision. Was there a recent Supreme Court ruling on that? I wouldn't. I tell you, see, there's one that's on everybody. Everybody's talking about right now the land okay. use bar and the land use and people who have interest. It's a case. Um, oh, I can't remember the style of case, but it, it has to do with the power of the planning commission to. Um, well, it involved the development of some property in. Uh, very hilly, hilly area. I want to say Bell's Bend, environmentally sensitive property in Nashville. And the Court of Appeals, not the Supreme Court, held that the long range plan, the land use plan, was it was called Nashville Next. And I think the sub area plan was maybe the Bellevue area plan, whoever, whichever sub area plan. That those you know, long range plans typically, including the land use plan, have been held to be, you know, influential. Uh, the zoning ought to be in, in in conformance with that. But the, at the end of the day, the zoning ordinance controls. You don't have to follow the long range plan. Well, what had happened is Metro had incorporated that long range plan standard about density of development on when there was hilltops and various things into its subdivision regulations. And the Court of Appeals held that if you do it that way. You, you do you you turn the long range plan into a law. That's the only thing recently I can think of that sounds a little bit like what you're talking about. I don't know. I can't. I'm not sure. 
what you said on the other that it doesn't it doesn't quite ring a bell. But I to tell you that's the song that's the one that's on everybody's mind right now for the last sixty days. How do we deal with that? I, I wouldn't be surprised if the parties don't take it to the Supreme Court. Let's see. Well, anyway, I'm sorry that, that I wasn't I wasn't ready to to uh, recite. I didn't, I didn't know my Latin. I, I didn't wasn't ready to stand and recite about that today, Mr. Harlan. So. <laughs> Son, see, you should have uh, done better. I took Latin at a school where they would literally box, they would box boys' ears who didn't know their Latin. So. That's why Steve still flinches a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Hey, hey um, Steve, I think this is Ron Ferris. I think that's a great question. Um, I think the ordinances line out things that these boards are being asked to interpret to a certain level. And when is it appropriate for some guidelines to these board members and to these chairmen to, to set a little clear understanding? I think the Brown one that he brought up, I was involved in is a very good question. I mean, our ordinances clearly state certain things that need to be met. And if they're met, it says X. And those ordinances were written uh, some time ago but they were written for a reason. They were written to give um, the citizens and the city the ability to grow or not grow. Um, I think the, the, the brown one is a question I've had in my mind since, it, since that occurred. Um, when, it, when is it appropriate for, for uh, you know, city council to step in and advise in, in matters like that? Well, Ron, Ron, just to come into that real quick, there's a sort of a separation of powers thing there. The city council shouldn't, doesn't supervise the, the decisions of any of those boards, but it can amend the ordinance. If one, if they think that the, uh, there, there's an ambiguity in the existing law. But yes, and to, if this is the question from both of you, uh, the ordinances of the city and the laws of the state, but the ordinances of the city are, are, are laws and they are to be followed. And if the planning commission on the one hand or the board of zoning appeals or the historic zoning commission needs to interpret those ordinances or guidelines um, then and make its decisions, then that's absolutely what it should do and should follow that. And, and, and the legal, the, the good news is, well, the good news or just the news is when a court reviews that, they are to, to defer to the decision of the local government agency unless it's quote arbitrary and capricious. And so there's a, there's a deference to the local board. Now it's a little different to start a zoning commission for some reason that wrote that statute. So you can actually have a new trial in court, which is insane. But anyway, uh, we we had a, we had that kind of we had that shot fired across our bow now uh, a month or two ago. By some, they may be in they may be in attendance here, and I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but it was you know they they talked about the possibility of, of a court challenge to HCC's ruling. And reminded us that if that happened, they would actually go to court, and there would be no deference to the board's decision. We'd have a new trial. But otherwise, when the court reviews this, our interpretation of our own ordinance is given great deference by the court. So I, I couldn't agree. If, you, if you're talking about do we need to follow our own law, the answer is yes, absolutely. Doug, um, I've recently had someone call me concerned about one lot subdivisions and their concern was that we're going to have a bunch more come before us one because land seven. values there are going to be a lot more uh, cases come before us, one lot subdivision off a large park and the concern of the person was um, it's going to run headlong into the HCC commission um where very valuable land um is going to become a priority for the seller of the property over the discretion of the planning commission or the hcc or anybody else and their point was we're getting ready to see more of these which then leads into the question of whether or not we have discretion within the planning commission, board of zoning appeals, et cetera, to make decisions which are in the best interest of the city, but not necessarily in compliance with the rules. 
No. So the reason why I say that, let's back up just a second. When they come to Lyle, the first first place the people go is Lyle, right? Right. Okay. Lyle reads the book and says, here's what you got to do to comply. If they comply, Lyle will usually bring it to us as far as the planning commission is concerned and say, here's what's proposed. Here's the compliance. Here's the subdivision. Here's what they want to do. It complies with all rules and regulations of the city of Bell A right. hundred neighbors show up. And then, well, it did in this Brown case. I wasn't there for that. Yeah, this was under Bob Patterson. Uh, it did in the Brown case, and we're going to have more of these come up. Yeah. And what you're saying to me, and I think this is important for all our board members to know this, if Lyle says it's so, and if Lyle says it's legal, we don't have a choice. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> all right. Well, we could is it black and white or is it gray? You could disagree with Lyle, and although I have total confidence in Lyle's judgment. So do we. So do we. I know you do. You know, that's why we talked, that's why we jumping back a frame and talked about proper procedure and communicating with staff and so forth to our boards is, you know, Lyle it represents the city. These boards are like administrative agencies. They're supposed to be neutral. So they are administrative agencies. So the city as the city, city staff is one party. The, the applicant is a party and the neighbors are. There's three, three people going on. So that's why we try to say, look, let's limit communications with staff to what's absolutely necessary. And, and, and so Lyle comes in and says, this is my interpretation. Now, the board should not, the board of commission should not depart from that for no reason. It's because they think, well, it's this bad policy. Uh, it's a bad idea for the city. You don't have that power. Um, so if there's a legitimate question about interpretation, no, maybe I would offer the, the contrary interpretation, or maybe the opposing, the opposing party's lawyer, the applicant's lawyer, would bring up something that made sense. It's, it, 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 our boards have some discretion, but if you don't have discretion to to uh, change the rules or not apply the rules, and that's the board, the board, the council, the, the commission. To give, that's their prerogative to amend the ordinances. And if you identify this problem soon enough, you say this is going to happen again. And we can go to the go to the commissioners and say, look, board commissioners and say, look, we, we see this as a problem coming up. We need to think about amending the ordinance to do da 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 and prevent this type of development. But I don't see, I wasn't there for that, and I, I don't know what advice you got or what what the, it happened, but the planning well, commission. Let me ask, not, let me ask, let's last a while. Right. Wow, did I misrepresent what took place? No, you didn't. Basically, when I vet someone to come to the planning commission, BZA, or whatever it may be, in my mind, they've checked all the boxes to appear, and that's only when I would say staff recommends. It's, in my mind, up to that board to deliberate on that and, and verify my findings as far as checking the boxes. Yes, I think you stated that correctly. Well, I also want to protect Lyle in this situation, because if a hundred neighbors show up in opposition to something, I don't want to as chair, nor any of us as chairs, to say, well, Lyle said it was okay, so it's okay. Next, what else do you want to talk about? That's going to be unfair to the neighbors. I mean, we can listen all night long to them, but at the end of the day, I could say, Lyle said it was good, so let's do it. And Steve, uh, this was just a decision to flat some property. That's all it was, a flat. It was, yeah, to subdivide a single lot. We were asked to, because it was a corner lot, we were being asked to establish the setbacks on the front and side lots. Yeah. It was at the discretion of the planning commission. Yeah, that's, an, that's a bill. Thank that's, you for where, that's where the neighbors came up fighting. Yeah. Where we were being asked for discretion. Well, that's interesting, Larry. I, I didn't know that. And thank you, Larry. Bellmead has this peculiar ordinance, unusual, which is it is what it is, which does give the planning commission some discretion for just like establishing a new building envelope. Is that that deal? 
And that's really, that's more a border zone and appeals type thing to me, but it's okay. It goes to the planning commission here. I do think there's some discretion there. But if you're just talking about applying the, the, uh, uh, the plat, the, uh, the subdivision regulations to a, to a, to a uh, subdivision, and the evidence is black and white, this meets the, meets the uh, requirements of subdivision regulations and, and allows, the, allows the person, we have no reason to second guess his decisions. And it'd be very hard unless it was just a, a mistake, uh, a, a mistake on the face of it that he's made. And, you know, I don't think I don't see that's gonna happen. So, but this thing about redrawing a building and what that is, that is, got, that does have some discretion to it, uh, Larry. Uh, Doug, just to clarify, uh, you, you're you're stating that to establish a building envelope. I thought I heard you say something about the Board of Zoning Appeals. That that feel no, I'm just it, it's clearly belongs to the Planning Commission. Okay, I've never You're heard right. of a Planning Commission with that authority other than the City of Bell meeting. Nope. Okay, um, I'm just saying it feels more like a Board of Zoning Appeals ish decision to me, but that's not the way we set it up. So I'm not going to worry about it. So Here, I have a question. Uh, Doug, because of that situation, I mean, they came in, they wanted to split the lot, sell off a piece, right? All fit within the setbacks and everything, right. and then the people came in, and you know, the neighbors came in, and so now, do we have a precedent? And are we going to be? Uh, is it going to create issues? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what kind of. If you're talking about a procedural precedent, I mean. But, Planning Commission, let me say, Planning Commission, except for decisions like that, probably has the least discretion of any of your of your boards, just the way it's set up and the way its its authority is established by state law. That that sort of decision is appears to have some discretion to it. Um, my favorite response about precedent, you know, for all these boards is every piece of property is unique. And that's really, and that's not an evasion, that's really true. Uh, they have different neighbors, you have different layouts, you have different um, uh, you know, tree coverage, whatever you want to say. And so I tried to get myself to torn up about precedent and land use decisions. I've never seen it used. To, it may feel like the board is like, well, we did this over here, we got to do it here. And I understand the board wants to be consistent, but I don't look at it as a precedent that's binding in the legal sense. I think that's, my, that's been my take on it. And, still here. So. Doug, I've got a question wondering, um, you know, from my time on the zoning board, which I think it sort of gets at what we're talking about with this, um, with this municipal planning situation. It, if the question is that whether something meets all of the criteria, does that board have the authority to not approve it? And I, I believe the answer is no, leading me to the right. So leading me to the second part, which is like on the BZA, for example, we see on the agenda almost every time it is filled with swimming pools within the building envelope. Right. Well, we do not have the authority to not approve them. So it has occurred to me um, just borrowing, um, you know, a procedure used at the Capitol, uh, these consent agendas where things that are sort of meeting every criteria and aren't really debatable more or less uh, fall on a consent agenda. And you can always, everybody has the opportunity, as you know, to pull something from the consent agenda for further consideration if it becomes problematic or in this situation, uh, hundreds of neighbors are, you know, showing up and you need to as representatives of, you know, this constituency pull it. Please don't but, make it. Please don't make me follow the rules. Please don't make us follow the rules of the Capitol. Um, no, no, no. And I don't no, mean it that way. I'm saying, but the, would a consent agenda in some situations, where, where I'm going with that is, I think as we're asking residents to volunteer their time in a way that, you know, can have, unfortunately, social implications for themselves. And you put people in a really awkward position where other people can really sort of attack you or come at you and you need something to stand behind. And it's, it's frustrating when those ordinances are, aren't clear. And so it's great to be able to say, you know what, unfortunately, we don't have the authority to not approve it. 
And if we need to fix those things, then the following time we do that. But you yeah. see what I'm saying? It, 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 it's helpful, I think, to have that cover. Well, <laughs> you're trying to make sure oh. Mayor, you're trying to make sure Mayor Hunt never gets an appointment again. Uh, <laughs> never gets anybody. The, to the broader the broader question of Haley, and this is Ron Ferris. The broader question of Haley, and I've had this question. I had a question some time ago, by the way. Go ahead, Ron. Why, if pools are inside the setbacks, why are they being heard, heard by any board? All right, now that this is this is once and for all on this. Okay, I'm going to go back. This is responsive to Haley, but I'm going to come back to that. So, consent agendas are are frequently used. It's fairly new, actually, because I remember when Franklin, when we, we had a hundred item, we had a hundred item planning commission agendas. And so we said, let's do some of this on consent. Nashville uses consent agenda. I don't see if any bell need agendas long enough to warrant that, but it may happen. On the swimming pools, this is Lyle and my, it's been a, something we've talked about as soon as I met Lyle, practically, why are we doing this? It is a conditional use. So it's in the building permit, the building envelope, but there are, are things which need to be considered under the under philosophy of our current ordinance. And that is that the cost of noise, uh, where it's located within the building envelope, is there some need to insist on, um, you know, more landscaping? Uh, fences. And other fences. And, and, and let me say this, I, no city, including our, our cities like our cities that are our closest peers, like Oak Hill and Forest Hills, nobody does this as a conditional use permit. I would gladly have that not be a conditional use permit. Uh, I, it, but it, right now, there are some discretionary decisions that can still be made on whether a pool should be allowed or not. I think it's, my personal view is that those are inherently legislative decisions. Uh, you know, and, and it's just not, not, not a, not a BZA type decision. I rarely, anyway, I know Pete has been on the, was on the BZA for a long time and he may differ slightly with that view, but I don't see the point in it but it's not, it says there is our currently our law. And that's a question for our board of commissioners. If they want to change that, we can try to change. So the answer to, and, and you've answered my question, but I want to be clear. The answer to my clients is it's a conditional use and yeah. that is the, that is currently how it's written and it has to be heard. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, right. so, Karen had a question about five people ago and I, I'm able to see her. I can't see everyone else. So Karen, did you have a question? Karen Rich? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to follow along with some of these things, but um, I, I missed the, the Brown property, but I, I know that I'm not sure what that issue was. I was just confused a bit on, uh, if Lyle was approving, uh, he's putting something before us to vote on that's basically in compliance with the rules, but a bunch of people showed up saying they didn't like it, right. but it wasn't a conditional use situation. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, wait, go ahead, finish, please. Was it a situation where the property, okay, the property was being subdivided um, had the building envelopes been defined on those subdivided lots before approval, or does that is that something that comes afterwards? And that was the part people didn't like the building envelope part. I'm going to have to defer to Lyle and Larry and those who were actually there. My initial response was that the plan commission has little to no discretion on approving a flat on disapproving a flat which the building official has told them, and there's no evidence to the contrary, meets all the criteria of the subdivision regulations. No, you just can't and do that. Like street front end, yeah. all of that. But, but here, it sounds like this had a slightly different uh, set of facts. So I, if, if we want to go over that again, Lyle and, and Larry, what, what, what was the difference here? Larry, I'll, I'll refer to you <laughs> on that one. <laughs> now, correct me if you disagree with any of this. The city had recently passed the corner lot ordinance that, that gave discretion on setbacks for corner lots. The case came before us to do two things. One was to split this piece of property. But then when we split it, it created 
two corner lots. The okay. tide with the splitting of it was asking us to establish the building envelopes on these two new corner lots. And it was kind of rolled into one presentation to the planning commission that okay. you know, to create the two lots for to create the two corner lots first um, and almost should have been broke I mean, in my opinion it's broken into two pieces because one decision to split the lot and the second would have been to define the the setbacks but you'd never split it if you weren't going to get the setbacks approved well is that kind of it's yes like and I, I'll expand on that a little more. They, I think it was about three acres and they had enough square footage to develop two lots. You've got to have 40,000 square feet or more to create a lot. And I believe it's uh, 125 feet of road frontage. Um, and they had that and they had buildable envelopes within those lots, but the neighbors, I don't think they wanted to see two houses on that lot. So they kind of came out in full force and the planning commission agreed with the neighbors. There was also a historical part of it, Larry, if you remember, the intent of the original subdivision plat for the entire street of Jackson was for larger houses on larger lots. And I think that's what we ultimately went back to saying that was the intent that's what we think should take place, which then made the neighbors happy. Yeah. And was there any court? Was there any court challenge filed to that? No. Uh, and the reason why the reason why I bring up court challenges is, I don't know many folks that come before either the planning commission or the BZA that want to stir up a hornet's nest before no. they move into their house. I agree. That's that's a, that's some luck doesn't mean we ought to not do our job as well as we can, but no. I, I think I've only seen one case where Bell Mead was a part, one zoning case. Uh, over the years, there may have been more. It was a reported case uh, where Bell Mead was a party. It was a, I can't remember what it was about. Um, yeah, but all I can say is, as, as a closing statement on that, that decision is, that's an unusual grant of authority for a planning commission to do what you did. If there's some discretion involved, I think that probably, you know, you can say that the neighbor's opinions were relevant, but if you're just talking about a straight flat division, a reset division, and it's just plain vanilla, and for some reason people don't like it, who knows why, then that's not gonna, they don't have the right, really even the right to be heard, unless they, I mean, theoretically, the immediate neighbors, I don't know, and there's a several, some flat decisions, for example, where the uh, new subdivision of ground access out one way and they could have dead into it or something. You know, people who are affected have the right to appeal, but the fact that 100 people showed up almost tells me it's not a, a flat decision, it's something else. So anyway, that may be something we'll have to board of commissioners will have to look at if that's a um, problem. It doesn't sound like it's been very often uh, yeah, no, it hadn't been often, but and I'm I'm pleased to hear what you're saying because it's going to make our job a lot easier. It's yeah. black and white. We don't we we will not deal with the gray. That's true. That's okay. thank that, you. I tell people I tell people that all all the time because you know, it's you know pitchforks and torches uh, <laughs> doesn't always work. Right. I, I have an I have another question since we're all together um, on variances because we we have a lot of variances. Uh, that come up. I mean, almost every session. So the question is, is it really our role to rule on variances or should that go through the Municipal Planning Commission before it comes to us? It does not have anything to do with the Planning Commission. It is 100% the role of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Okay, because it's land use, right? Which it's is one of, it's one of the, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of the, it's the basic, classic authority of a board of a zoning board to hear cases for variances. It's not a case for people zoning appeals. Just don't I, I would love that. Now some cities combine the two boards, you know, but I don't think that would be any fun. Steve no. is saying he doesn't want Steve doesn't want variances. That's the most important thing. I <laughs> know no, Steve doesn't want it. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
I, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't get off on the uh, possible changes to our jurisdiction of our boards. That, that's that's a topic for another day. That's, uh, if you don't mind. Anything else? Uh, who called this meeting? <laughs> you did. <laughs> Doesn't sound like something I would do. Doug, let me say one final thing. Yeah. Lyle does a super job yes. of putting together information for us. And 99 out of 100 times, and usually 100 out of 100 times, um, we go with whatever Lyle says. Yeah. And it's because he's such a great professional and does such a great job that it's pretty sanitized by the time it gets on our desk. So as thank you for his as hard work. As it should be. Yeah. Uh, this is Bob. Hey, Bob. Hey. Uh, are each one of these uh, departments supposed to be run basically like the commissioner's meeting? Each of the each of the well, board. I mean, for instance, I notice on the commissioners meeting we do some things that the, we don't do in the MPC or the board of zoning appeals, such, such as uh, is the pledge of allegiance part of Robert's rules? No, it's not. Okay. Should I mean, should, should these departments mimic the commissioners meeting and do that? Not to my knowledge. Uh, I, uh, I mean, is it just an unwritten rule that they should do that, or is that? Uh, no, they, they exist for a different. They have their own rules and bylaws. Uh, the board, the board commissioners can, by ordinance, establish bylaws for these boards, and then they have the right to amend to add to that on their own. Uh, and I notice these different departments. We do not uh, recognize the public. The, the you don't department. have to. Do, you don't have to do that. You don't have to uh, do that. Okay. No, no. I, that's a good question, Bob. I mean, honestly, if there's a, let's say the board has the board the commissioner's agenda is set by ordinance, and that does have to you know, recognize the public and all this stuff. If you permit me one more. One, permit me one more war story. You know, there's an exception for leg. I notice we don't have prayers, and that's fine. I, that's I can live with that. Uh, if there's a legislative prayer is an exception to the separation of church and, church and state for historic reasons, but and I never saw any board, uh, and Franklin had a, legis had a prayer before the board meeting, not any other boards. Now down at, down at Smyrna, where I served for a while as interim city attorney, they used to pray before every board, every meeting, including the beer board. I thought it was kind of, kind of cute. I mean, it's like <laughs> all these, I guess they're praying that it keeps on coming. I don't know, it keeps flowing, I don't know. Uh, I thought, but anyway, it's fine with me. The pledge is just enough. Just enough. And, and and because of the times we're in, as far as the uh, the uh, COVID nineteen using Zoom, is there any uh, thing that we should leave out or or should not leave out when we do it in Zoom? I, I wouldn't say so. I think just be careful. I haven't looked at this recently, but make sure we do comply with the order, uh, the state's order about how to run these meetings. And I think particularly, I think our chairs uh, are doing a good job keeping things formal. And I, the one thing I would just emphasize again is to make people who, who speak who are not members of the board, members of the public, or, or to identify themselves with their name and address. So the record of it will be clear on that. So. Well, I appreciate you having this meeting. I think it's very helpful for a guy that. Any, any time I've enjoyed doing this over the years and have done it a, a lot and it's something that's helpful, I hope. Uh, it's very helpful for me. Thank you. Buddy, thank you all. Steve, Thanks, uh, appreciate Steve, it. Steve, Steve Hall, I, I just want to thank you for your kind words. Much yeah. appreciated. Well, all thank you guys. Doing a great, I mean, these board, I, I think it's running great. So, you know, as I say, some days we get better style points than others. We're still in the game. So. When in doubt, ask Doug. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> our, that's what my wife says, right? Yeah, sure. That'll happen. That'll happen. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much.